songs because every church sings them around this time of year. And it reminds me of growing up in my home church and we would sing those same hymns uh, around Easter time. And just, uh, it's wonderful uh, to be able to sing his praise. All right, we're going to pick up with the message we started with this morning. Uh, titled Dispensational Revelation, the Age of Pro uh, Promise. And we're stu studying dispensationalism so that we can get a, a proper view of God's history uh, through the scriptures, from Genesis to the book of Revelation. We have a start point and an ending point for each dispensation. Each dispensation involves five things. I'm curious if you can tell me what they are. Uh, one message I did on human government, I tried to do all five in one sermon. And I was sweating when the sermon was over. And I wish I would have spread it out a little bit. And that's why we're spreading this one out some. What are the five things? What's the first thing that we've covered with each dispensation? Nope, that's the second. So we got number two. What's the first? No, that goes with revelation and responsibility. They're one and the same. That's one of the dispensations. That's the first dispensation we study. We studied innocence, conscience. What's the other one? Human government. And what are we on now? Promise. So this is our fourth dispensation. But each dispensation has five things. We got number two, and that is revelation. Number one, subjects. Yeah, we have to know who's part of that dispensation, the subjects. And then revelation. And what's the third one? Failure. And then following the failure is judgment. And what's the last one? God's intervention. Gracious intervention. That's what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, we've covered the first four so far uh, of this dispensation. Tonight we want to cover God's gracious intervention. I read a verse for you today from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, that says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Let's bow for a word of prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, you are faithful. You are our anchor, our rock, our fortress, our tower of refuge. You are the one to whom we can lean and never fall. We are so thankful for your love and your grace. And we're thankful for each time we fail, you intervene. Your love conquers and we know that we are more than conquerors because you've loved us and you sent your son to die for us. Thank you for intervening in our behalf again and again. Father, we pray that we might grow in our faith and ultimately our faithfulness. And Father, we see these characters in the scriptures were flawed characters. But they grew. And they became spiritual giants. Father, help us to follow in the footsteps of those who followed you. And help each of us to become more like your son. Father, we rejoice in knowing that he lives. And knowing that someday we will see him face to face. Father, we pray that he will be honored, for it's in his name that we ask it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want you to turn your Bibles tonight to Psalm 37. Because I have a chance to spend a little bit more time on this outline, I want to take uh, advantage of this passage of Scripture, Psalm 37. And um, while you're turning there, I just want to highlight the fact that uh, even though man has failed, God's plan for mankind will succeed. Amen? And you see that through history. And that's why in each of these dispensations, the story isn't over. It continues. And God's plan for his people is still going to be accomplished. And Jesus is going to come back to this earth and sit upon the throne and reign. And I, I look forward to that day when Jesus is the king. Um, so we have that future to look forward to. And even though Jesus has come, 
and, his, and, and that promise has been fulfilled, we still are waiting on the promise of His return. And uh, so as New Testament believers, we can identify with Abraham. We can identify with the patriarchs who were given a promise and then had to wait for it. And so in a lot of our New Testament epistles, Abraham is a key figure to encourage our faithfulness to God. And we saw in the morning message, Abraham had a pretty big blunder. (laughs) He uh, took Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden, uh, an Egyptian woman, uh, and had the child Ishmael. And that blunder, uh, of course, if you study the, the results of the relationship between the Ishmaelites and the Israelites, you'll see uh, a constant struggle in history. But along with that, we have the fact that Abraham didn't always doubt God, did he? The Bible says he believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Later, we're told in the book of James that he was counted righteous uh, for another reason. Because he offered up Isaac upon the altar. And that's significant growth, wouldn't you agree? From where he, was, where he was when they left the land and to go into the land of Canaan, I believe in his 70s, probably had uh, Ishmael probably when he was around 88, uh, 89. And then Isaac was born when he was 100 years old. Uh, Sarah got pregnant with Isaac. And so all this time has passed from that blunder. By the time Isaac is around the age Ishmael was when uh, Isaac was born, God asked Abraham to offer him up. And I think that is something that if God asked of us, would we have that kind of faith? And so as much as in the morning message, we kind of look down a little bit on Abraham for his lack of faith, we also have to recognize he grew. There's a period of over 20 years there. And in that period of 20 years, his faith increased. And I hope that's true of us. I hope that my faith is stronger when I'm 50 than now in my 30s. And I hope that you can say the same. And so Abraham becomes an example of faith and that, and that growing process. But if you remember, if you can recall, when Abraham was going up the mountain and he told his servants, me and the lad will return. Now he knew what God asked of him, but he had faith that if God required that, he would still keep his promise and raise Isaac from the dead. That is faith. Amen? And that's the kind of faith that we're called to as God's people. And that's the kind of faith that doesn't come easy. It's the kind of faith that you have to develop by having a deep relationship with God. And Abraham developed that faith. And as we looked at in our first message of dispensation, Abraham is called in the book of James, the friend of God. And so uh, I want to just encourage you when you think about Uh, your life and sometimes you're going to go through some things that you're going to scratch your head over and wonder is why where's God now why is this happening to me what have I done to deserve this all of those questions will race in your mind and yet you have to remember that God has a plan and a purpose when those things come into your life The Egyptian bondage served a purpose for his people. Because prior to the bondage, you know what they were not doing? They were not praying. They were not calling out to God. But you know what did lead to them calling out to God? Egyptian bondage. I I found it interesting. uh, I have a, a fish tank, and my fish are all pretty small. But they say that if you capture a shark as a baby, they're about six inches long. If you put them in a small aquarium, they'll stay six inches long. But if you take it out of the aquarium and put it in the ocean, it will grow up to eight feet or larger just by changing its environment. 
You know what God has to do in our lives sometimes? Change our environment. Because like the Israelites, we go to a place where we find comfort. They had the, the farmland, they had the herbs, they had the food, they had, uh, they had lush lands and homes and everything they could have wanted. They were comfortable. But by being comfortable, they became complacent. That never happens to God's people today. Right? And so what happens sometimes is God has to stir things up. And we never like it. <laughs> but it's a necessary requirement for our spiritual growth. I like what John Ortberg... Have you ever read the Bible, If You Want to Walk on Water, Get Out of the Boat? Have you ever read that book? It's a good book. It's about faith. And in the book he says... Most of the time when we study the account when Peter walked on water, we, were, we focus on when he took his eyes off the Lord. And he began to sink. The winds blew and, and he began to sink. And it, it says he, he, he looked at the waves. And, everyone, and we focus on Peter's failure. But in that book, he highlights the fact that while Peter failed in that circumstance, his faith was still greater than the leaven that were still in the boat. Their failure was greater than his because he took a risk. And one of the reasons we don't take risks for Christ is because we're comfortable. I, um, let me word this his way. He says, the decision to grow always involves a choice between risk and comfort. This means that to be a follower of Jesus... You must renounce comfort as the ultimate value of your life. And that's a sobering thought because comfort is what we strive for. I also like a, a book, Tim Hansel has a book called When I Relax, I Feel Guilty. Uh, I, <laughs> I like the title. But he says... A lot, of, a lot of believers would like to buy $3 worth of God. Just enough, not, to, just to, enough to, uh, not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. And he says, if we would be totally honest, the idea of transformation scares us. That's because we know that such a radical change would be quite uncomfortable. God knows that we need radical change. How do we know that we need radical change? What have we learned so far in all the dispensations we've covered? That in each case, man has what? Failed to obey God. So you know what that means? We need transformation, don't we? And God wants to help us with it. But the real question is, do we want his help? Because it took bondage before the Egyptian people cried out to God and said, deliver us. What will it take in our lives for us to say, God, I'm ready. What do you want to do with me? It's not us telling God what we'd like to do. Could you imagine if God came to Noah and, and he says, Noah, there's going to be a flood and this entire earth is going to be covered with water. Now, what would you like to do about this? You think that's how it works? No. God says, Noah, this is what I want you to do. And Noah has the choice to obey or disobey. It's like that with us. God confronts us with what he wants. We have to make a choice. But when we make the wrong choice, we'll regret it. And I think that's true of the patriarchal fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they all had regrets. And their regrets revolved around times in their life where they disobeyed God. Well, you know, I said in the morning message, since I have a little bit extra time and I'll use it, I said in the morning message that uh, there's a tendency to want to do things our own way. We have our own ideas and our own plans, and we kind of take matters into our own hands, especially when we're put on hold. When we don't have answers, 
we will we'll just look for something else to give us the answers. I like Mike mentioned this morning after the message, he said, you know, you don't read about them asking God if they should go to Egypt. You don't read about them praying about what they should do because of the famine. They just made a decision. And we do that. We don't like to have to wait to make a good decision. We just want to make a decision. Sometimes we do things our own way. And that reminds me when I was a kid and we would go on vacation. Eventually, my brother and sister got married. I was still, you know, in school, you know, at home with my parents. And we would start to take a vacation and my brother would have his wife and my sister would have her husband. Then we'd have my mom and dad and we'd have me. And if you've ever gone to vacation with three families... Everybody has something else they want to do, right? Everybody has their own agenda. And then you get there and you're like, well, I don't want to eat there. I thought we'd eat there Friday. And they're like, no, no, we should eat there tonight because it's closer to this place. I wanted to swing by and visit. And they're like, well, I didn't want to go to that place. What am I going to do there for two hours? And on and on it goes, right? And ultimately, the whole week could be spent having those kind of conversations if somebody doesn't step up and say, this is what we're going to do. And for that to happen, somebody has to be in charge, correct? Who do you think it was in my family? <laughs> That's so funny. I can't wait to tell her you guys said that. Yeah. I was waiting for you to say my dad, but I, I get a kick out of that. You know, she turns the head, right? Uh, so she's the neck that turns the head. That's pretty funny. But no, there has to be someone in charge. And it's true in our lives as well. If we're trying to figure everything out on our own, we're in big trouble. If we're making all the decisions on our own, we're in big trouble. God is in charge. Let him be God. Amen? And so we see this in, in our account in Psalm 37. Some of our favorite verses we like to quote comes from this psalm. And we see that in Israel's failure, they kept... Uh, leaving the land that God had promised to them to go to Egypt. And the psalmist seems to, to kind of focus on this. And so we have the verse in verse 23. It says, the steps of the good man are what? Ordered by the Lord. Who's in charge? God's in charge. He's the one who calls the shots. If you want to have your, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now look at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou what? Dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Well, they encountered famine after famine, huh? They like Lot having their, his eyes set towards Sodom. Their eyes were set towards Egypt. Now it says, we love to quote verse 4, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee what? The desires of your heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. This is the instructions that the patriarchal fathers should have been obeying as they were leading their families. Remember the verse we looked at in the morning message, Psalm 105? It says, the staff of bread was broken. The staff, the leadership, the ones who should have been leading the family to what? Trust God, delight in God, wait upon God. And dwell in the land. Let me give you, give you another verse. Verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. The one prospering in that circumstance was Egypt. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Now I want you to go over to um, verse 29. The righteous shall inherit what? the land, and dwell therein forever. I like verse 34. Wait on the Lord and keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to what? Inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Over and over again, we're told in this psalm, trust, wait, and, you'll in and inherit the land. Is that what the patriarch fathers did? <laughs> no. So we saw their failure in the morning message. I, um, as much as I read about their failure and I want to say, what were you thinking? 
I can look back in my own life and at some of the decisions I've made and I have to say the same thing. What was I thinking? Did I pray about that? Did I ask God? Did I wait? Well, we saw, for that reason, they went into Egyptian bondage. I want to uh, read another verse um, to you. I want you to turn to, uh, turn to Genesis chapter 46 in your Bibles. And here we're going to see God's gracious intervention. Despite the fact that they did fail the Lord and they didn't dwell in the land, God still intervened. Even though there was a famine that was sent, God had, had promised a deliverer. And the first deliverer in this dispensation was Joseph. Um, so look at Genesis chapter 46, verses 2 through 4. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night, and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thy eyes. And so here is God's promise. Here is his intervention. I know what's happening. I am going to give you a deliverer. Your deliverer will be Joseph, and you will see him before you die. That's encouraging words, isn't it, for Jacob? After everything else that had happened, and he thought his son was dead. And now we see, uh, look at Genesis chapter 50 and verse 2. Genesis 50, verse 2. And it's, I'm sorry, I gave you verse 20. Genesis 50, verse 20. Here Joseph speaking to his brother, and he says, But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for what? Good. And again, their intentions were evil. Their plan was wicked. But God had superseded their plans, didn't he? Because God kept his covenant with Abraham. Because God's covenant with Abraham was an unconditional covenant. Do you realize that the covenant that you and I are under is an unconditional covenant? See, a lot of people teach that you can lose your salvation. And I think, well, look at what the Israelites did to provoke God. And because of his covenant to Abraham, he continued to see them through. Again and again and again and again. It's no different with us. Under the new covenant, we are under, under an unconditional covenant. And God, that means that the covenant depends on God keeping his word, not us keeping our word. And that's, that's a praise. <laughs> when you see how, how much we sometimes mess up. Uh, that's a praise. Um, the next dispensation, we'll see a conditional covenant. When man entered that, boy, did he get trouble. Um, but here we see Joseph as a deliverer. What, what they meant for evil, God in his sovereignty was able to use for good. And I will say this, maybe as I said in the morning message, maybe you've gotten off the path. Maybe you've been ordering your own steps. Maybe the choices you've made, you know, are, are not bringing any kind of peace or contentment into your life. And a lot of times when we make bad choices, we are left with broken pieces. Broken pieces of our heart. Um, I could give you an exa lots of examples of people who have broken lives because of bad decisions. But the encouragement is God is sovereign and he can put those pieces back together again. If you'll come to him, if you'll turn it over to him, he can and will help you. I like this, uh, you know, this illustration on the royal palace of Tehran. Uh, this is Iran. One of the most beautiful entrances of all the palaces in the world today is in this palace in Tehran. 
And it's a royal palace. It has domes, ceilings, sidewalls, columns. Uh, it, it, it looks like it's covered with diamonds. But it's actually covered in glass. It was supposed to be an entrance what with mirrors from floor to ceiling. But when the boxes of the mirrors arrived, they were all what? Broken. And they were going to send them back. And one of the architects said, well, let me see that box. And he began to pull them out. And he began to look at how those pieces could be put back together. And he said, I think we've got something. And so they put them on the wall as all these little individual shards of glass. And, it, and they connected it in such a way that it makes a pattern. And I say it's one of the most beautiful interests of any palace in the world. Because they were able to take something broken and turn it into something beautiful. But I can tell you, as good as that architect was, God is better. Amen? So if you're off the path, you can get back on the path. That's God's invitation to you. That's what God desires for you. And so we see Joseph is a deliverer, and God turned things around and delivered his people in the land of Egypt. Then they become comfortable and complacent, and even though Joseph said, go take my body back, they stayed. And, uh, and so that, now we see a second deliverer, Moses. Look with me in Exodus chapter 3. We'll start in verse 6. Exodus chapter 3, God's second deliverer in this dispensation. So first he intervenes with Joseph, now he intervenes with Moses. In chapter 3 of verse 6 of Exodus says, Moreover he said, I am the, the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. This is when he saw the consuming fire in the holy ground. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. You know, there's not pro that, that is such a deep statement from God to say, I know their sorrows, because Jesus was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And since time is, is eternal with God, it's always constant. Uh, that takes a long time to explain. But theologically, for God, it's always, everything's on the moment. And so when he could say that, I know their sorrows, he knew exactly with his foreknowledge what Jesus was going to experience, what Jesus was going to go through. And Jesus identifies with us in our grief. And I think it's significant that in the Old Testament, when the angel of the Lord appeared, that was a pre-incarnate image of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who identifies with us the most in our hurt, in our pain, in our sorrow. So here we see, and, he's, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. I've heard the cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land, what? Flowing with milk and honey. You know what that tells me? That as good as the land of Goshen was that Joseph gave to his descendants in Egypt, the land that God had for them was better. And that is true in your life and mine. might not be the picture that you think, but it will always be better. And so this land flowing with milk and honey unto a place, the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites... Now, therefore, behold the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will what? Send thee unto Pharaoh. There's a whole other message about Moses' struggle. He was certainly a meek man, <laughs> but I think the idea of the responsibility that God was giving him uh, scared him. And I think it would us too. But Moses is now being sent. He is now going to be the deliverer. And this is God intervening on behalf of his people. And two things stand out. Now, we could go over many miracles. If you want to, write down Psalm 107 on your outline. There it goes over and over again. The Lord is good. Give thanks to the Lord for his works. And you'll see a list of the works of God that he did for the people when he brought them out of Egypt. 
We're not going to cover what all those works were, but I do want to look at two. I want to just highlight two. First of all, the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb, when the death angel was going to come, and God told his people that, that have the lamb without spot and blemish and put the blood on the doorpost, and the death angel would pass by. Now, like Abraham, when he left Canaan, at first the, the Israelite people obeyed God, and they put the blood on the doorposts. Then after they left Egypt, they began to, to cry out against God and be bitter. Anyway, so we see that, even, that, that spiritual growth process. But the Passover lamb is symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And so God promised that in the first dispensation, right? When Adam and Eve failed, we have the Proto-Evangelia, the first gospel in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, and I will raise up a seed of the woman. And then we see that continued with the sacrifice that Abel made that Cain couldn't accept in the next dispensation. Then we saw it in uh, Noah's dispensation. After the flood, Noah made an altar and he made a sacrifice unto the Lord. And we see this continual thought of the sacrifice being made as a picture and image of the ultimate promise that God will send a Redeemer who will save us from our sins. Do we need that salvation? <laughs> When you think about how many times we fail the Lord, yes, we need that Redeemer. And so that Passover lamb not only became a, a constant reminder as they had a feast and they had the, the annual Day of Atonement and, and, and through that, uh, with Moses' leadership, there was a constant reminder of God's promise that He would cleanse us, not by the blood of that lamb, but by the blood of Christ. And He would redeem us and set us free from judgment and sin. Not only that, but we also have the Red Sea. After the Passover lamb, the death angel, the next thing that happened after the people left Egypt is Pharaoh pursued them and God parted the Red Sea. And what's significant uh, about that miracle is not only is it grandeur, but the miracle, the fact that the Egyptians followed them into the sea and God let the waters fall. And wiped out an entire army. Really, Israel's enemy. In one blow. And so, um, certainly, there are a lot of other things we could look at. But I think we can admit that God intervened on behalf of his people in this dispensation. Uh, so, I mentioned in the morning message, the book of Genesis opens. In the beginning, God created. It closes within a coffin in Egypt. But aren't you glad that the beginning of Exodus, God sends a deliverer? You know, that's a picture. And so I put a quotation in your uh, handout there. If God puts you on hold, don't hang up. <laughs> I think about, now I don't know about you, but it, you know, we talk about patience. But anytime somebody puts me on hold on the phone, I think there's other things I could be doing than just sitting here holding a phone to my ear. You know, I'm always just thinking, well, just call me back or, you know, let me call you back. But, you know, what, what is this about? You know, just hold the phone. And we have a tendency, as soon as somebody puts us on hold, click. But I want to say this, if God puts you on hold, there's a reason for it. And waiting is part of the requirement of receiving his blessings. And that's clearly evident by our forefathers. Waiting is part of receiving God's blessing. So if God puts you on hold, what are you going to do? Wait. Amen. All right, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for our time together. And we thank you for your word. And we're thankful that Abraham, his descendants, they looked for that city whose builder and maker was you. They waited, and they anticipated, and they expected, Father, you to do what you have said, because you are all-powerful, and because you are unchangeable, and we know that you are perfect, and you will always keep your word. Thank you for being a constant in our lives, a constant companion, constant friend. Father, we need 
that today. Someone who makes a promise and keeps it. Thank you for being that someone in our lives. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's all stand together. We're going to again sing, I am resolved. And I think that's kind of how spiritual growth occurs. Uh, it's not from one or two experiences, but as we go through life, we have a lot of experiences. And those experiences help us to see all the more reason to put our faith and confidence in the Lord. All the more reason to say, you know what? I didn't trust him here and I regretted it. But when I have trusted him, I've never regretted it. And as we build those experiences with God, then we are reminded again and again, i got to stick with it. I am resolved. I am resolved to wait on the Lord. Um, the greatest thing you can have this side of heaven is a relationship to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose from the dead. He is at the right hand of the Father. And He has all power. And He will subdue His enemies. And He will come again to this earth and reign. And so the Lord Jesus Christ... He wants to be your Savior. And if you don't have Him tonight, then don't wait any longer. Resolve right now in this service to make Him your Savior today. Let's sing together.